Hi everyone, Elliot Jacobson here. And today I wanna to tell you the truth about infinite martingales. This video is the final in a three-part series where I first covered roulette, and then I covered Baccarat, and now finally we are going to talk about the situation where somehow we have come into possession of infinitely much money and we are playing at the great casino in the sky that has infinite table limits and to see whether that makes the least bit of difference, whether we can beat a casino game or not. So let's just get right to it. We have, as usual, a PowerPoint here. So I want to start with this very fascinating St. Petersburg paradox. So let me just read this to you, at least in part. So this was introduced by Nicholas Bernoulli in 1713. And this paradox is really one of the very first math puzzles. I remember seeing it when I was a junior undergraduate in a probability course that just caught my attention and my fascination. And I ended up doing a lot of computer programming back in the basic programming language, let's say in about 1977, uh, investigating this very paradox. So let me explain it to you. What we're gonna do is we're gonna play a little game and here's how the game works. We're just gonna flip a fair coin and we're gonna see how long it takes for that coin to turn up heads. Now, if it turns up heads on the first toss, um, I will get paid as the person who's playing this game, $2. If it turns up heads on the second toss, I'll get paid $4. On the third toss, $8. So every successive um, toss it takes until I get to that first head, I double my winnings. So the least I could win is $2. But really, there is no upper limit on the most I can win. And now the question that leads to this paradox is simply, how much should you, the person who is offering this game to me, charge me to play this game? In other words, we want to make this a fair game. In the long run, I'll win um, certain amounts and I'll, it'll be more or less depending on how long it takes to get to that first heads. And you want to be able to stay in business, so you want to know what's a fair price for you to charge um, for me to have the opportunity to play this fun game. So here's what it looks like um, if you were to actually write this out in a table. So we're going to just say the toss for the first heads that pays $2. If, if I get heads on the second toss, it pays $4, third, $8, and so on. And so in general, if I have, uh, if it takes X tosses to get that first heads, then I will um, get paid two to the X as uh, my award. Now, we can actually just sort of write down the probabilities of each of these events. So um, we know that half or 50% of the time, I will get heads on the very first toss. Now, if I got tails on the first toss and heads on the second toss, that happens one fourth of the time. And again, tails, tails, heads, that'll be with uh, probability one eighth. And in general, however many um, times it takes to get to that first heads, the probability of that particular sequence will be simply one over two to the x. So it'll be actually one over two to the x, not, not two to the x as I have written here. And so what this allows us to do is to write down a formula. How much can I, as a person playing this game, expect to win, right? Because whatever my expected win is, that's how much the person who is offering me this game should charge me to play to make it a perfectly fair game. Well, what we see is that half the time I win $2. A quarter of the time I win $4. An eighth of the time I win $8. And so on, right? A sixteenth of the time I win $16. So you notice that the numerator and the denominator exactly cancel out. So the expected amount um, for me to win in this game is 1 plus 1 plus 1 and so on. In other words, my expected win is infinity, is plus infinity. My expectation is to win infinitely much. Now, in practice, that's probably not going to happen, right? Because I'm sitting there flipping the coin. We all know that sooner or later it's going to turn up heads. But the, the real point here is there is no 
fair amount to be charged where I, as the player, won't completely crush the game. And, you know, the person can charge me $1,000 to play this once, and I might only win $2 back. But there is no amount that person could charge me to play this game that will be fair for the person offering this game, unless they charge me infinitely much money. And that's the universe we're living in. So just a fascinating paradox, but it has everything to do with infinite martingales. So let's actually do a martingale now, an infinite martingale where we are trying to beat the house. And we're going to play a very simple gambling game that has zero house hedge, namely flipping a coin. So the idea here is that I'm going to wager one unit, and if I win, I'll win one unit, and if I lose, I will double my wager, and I will continue to double my wager until finally I win, the coin turns up heads, right? And that will be the sequence that will ultimately generate a one unit win for me. And we actually can write this out in terms of a spreadsheet. So here's what it looks like. What we see is that um, we're going to have some sort of losing streak. And if just for example, let's look here. If my losing streak was length four, I would wager one and lose it, two and lose it, four and lose it, and eight and lose it. So one plus two plus four plus eight is 15. I would lose 15. But then I would win my 16 unit wager, right, for a net win of one unit. And what we see is that the amount I'm going to win are just these powers of two, just like the St. Petersburg paradox. And the amount that I'm going to lose because of my losing streak is always one unit less than that. It's simply the sum of all the wagers before that is always one unit less. And so I come out of this streak one unit ahead. Now, these probabilities, just like the St. Petersburg paradox, are one half, uh, one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth, and so on, the powers of two. So if my losing streak is zero, then I just win my one unit right away. If my losing streak is one, then I lost my one unit and I win a two unit and so on. So now let's sort of build up to infinity by talking about sort of the longest losing streak we could um, make. So for example, if we just restrict ourselves to this part here, where suppose we're in a universe where we're, most we could lose is 10 in a row, which is certainly not the case dealing with these infinities. So if my max losing streak is 10, then what is my average loss before I finally do um, have that winning uh, event? Well, how can we figure out the average loss? Well, these are my losses, right? 0, 1, 3, 7, 15, and so on. And these are the probabilities of those occurring. So as usual, the way you figure out an average is you do a weighted average. We multiply 0. 0.5 times 0. We multiply 0. 0.25 times 1. We multiply here. We multiply here. And we continue to multiply across to get a weighted average of each event. And then we add all of those things up. If you know a little vector analysis, it's the dot product of these two vectors. Or if you like, you can just use this sum product function from Excel that simply multiplies across and adds. Now, we can then look at a um, similar question for a max losing streak of 100. So first of all, if you have a max losing streak of 10, it comes out to be um, an average loss before we win of $4.50. If we have a max losing streak of 100, well, you simply go down here and you can see I have this going out to 100. And I simply computed the sum product of those and I got $49.50. And if I have a max losing streak of 1,000, then my average loss before a win is $499.50. So you see where this is going. If you use a martingale, if you use a martingale, an infinite martingale in an infinite casino with infinite cash, what is your average loss before you win? Well, with um, no limitation on your losing streak, that your average loss before you win using a martingale is to lose infinitely much money. And that might be hard to conceive because you know that's not going to be actually what happens to you losing forever and never winning again. But your, that is your expectation. 
your expected outcome is to lose infinitely much before you win again. I love that paradox, right? The paradoxes of infinities just stares right at you with that. So what is this telling us then? Well, um, if we actually look at this uh, computation again, um, these are the probabilities on the bottom, one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth, one thirty second, and so on. These are the amounts we're losing before we're winning. And I'm simply adding these fractions up. That's what these sum products are. So if you want to stop and look at this uh, mathematics for a minute, you are welcome to. This is where I actually show you that the amount for an infinite uh, martingale, the expected loss amount before a win is plus infinity. So I'm not going to go through this math. This is for the geeks out there who are looking at this who want to stare at the computation. Well, that is a pretty uh, stunning result. And what it means is that if you're playing a martingale, you know, you have your losing streaks where you lose several in a row, several in a row, but you always end up eventually winning the one unit, right? That's what's going to happen. But what it says is that at any given time, you can lose any given amount. In fact, your expectation is to lose infinitely much. So it doesn't matter how far ahead you are. It's irrelevant how much you have won in the past. Your expectation is to lose infinitely much, which means at any given point, you could have a result on the next sequence that is as bad as you could possibly conceive and you will be in the hole as much money as your mind can conceive of being. So what can we conclude about an infinite martingale? Well, the first thing is that no matter how much we are ahead, we will always be behind again at some point in the future. In fact, no matter how much we're ahead, we will be behind um, whatever amount of money you want to say will be behind that amount, right? And if you know very large numbers, Graham's number is a number that we will be behind. Look that one up, Graham's numbers. It's kind of a really big number out there um, if you like those sorts of things. So Google, you'll be behind at Google dollars infinitely often into the future. So those people who like to argue, well, but eventually you'll win another dollar. Well, that's true, but that doesn't mean it's a winning system because you will be ahead any amount in the future, but you'll always be behind any amount in the future. So just as often as you are ahead some amount, you will be behind some amount. And, um, you know, I mean, that's, that's the nature of this infinity, right? An infinite martingale is neither a winning nor a losing system. It is a system that is unbounded in both directions going um, forward into the future. Just as often as you win some amount, you will lose some amount because both of those will happen infinitely often. All right, so martingales, infinite martingales, infinite cash, paradox. Um, if you feel compelled to try and argue that an infinite martingale is a winning system, it is not. It is neither winning nor losing. It is a paradox, all right? Paradox means that there is no rational way of discussing winning or losing in the context of an infinite martingale, except to say that the expected loss on every single run of this system is to lose infinitely much. That is the one conclusion you can draw from this. So what do people actually say about these things? Well, they say these to me in comments, and also I see this stuff written all over the internet. The losing Baccarat player says, well, the most Baccarat, the most bankers I ever saw in a row was 21. So if a martingale would work, if I could just double up 22 times, right? Because I've never seen it happen 22 times. So what is this person saying? They're saying, well, if bankers come up 21 times, then somehow the universe prohibits it from, from happening a 22nd time. Just because you haven't experienced something doesn't mean that it can't happen. This is um, the gambler's fallacy that past events somehow make future events, their likelihood change. Just because you've had a long streak of bankers doesn't mean that the next um, hand to come out of the shoe is going to remember what that streak was or be any different because of that streak. These are independent events. It does absolutely not make any difference whatsoever that you had 21 bankers. Um, if you double up a 22nd time, 
then you just have the chances, um, the normal odds of banker and player. Now, just to put something else on this, 22 double ups is 4,194,304. So if you started, if your starting bet was $10, then on that 22nd double up, you would be at about a $42 million wager. Again, I guess we're sort of in a very wealthy person playing and uh, in a casino with very deep pockets to afford a $42 million wager, starting with the $10 wager. Um, all right, what else do losing Bakra players say? Well, they say, my friend has been playing Martingales for 10 years and he is one using this method. Well, two possibilities here. Either your friend is lying or he has not yet hit that mind-numbing, soul-crushing losing streak. That is the inevitable losing streak that every Martin Guild player will hit. Why? Well, because your expectation is minus infinity, right? <laughs> so please, um, all, if you are a Martin Guild player, you are destined to lose a lot of money. And just because your friend um, says that they've won using it, please don't let that um, have any effect whatsoever on making rational decisions about this. The third thing that um, a losing Baca player said is that I'm just talking about the, the long run and they're playing for the short run. Again, there is no such thing as the short run. You just don't play one day and walk out with your winnings and call that the short run. Oh, I just played one day. That's the short run. Let me come back the next day and just play one day. That's the short run. I'm just playing for the short run. You are playing one session, and that's the session of your life, right? You have one session. The cards don't care how much time has um, gone between hands. They're not going to say, oh, you left for the day. I forgot who you are. So you can win again, right? They don't know time. Cards don't understand time. You cannot bestow um, attributes that are that are human um, faults, right, onto inanimate objects and expect that they are going to somehow respond to that um, and know who you are and make you win again so that you can once again play in the short run. I'm not sure how that came out, but... I think you get the point here. So that's what we've got on um, infinite martingales. And this is really more of an academic discussion than it is a, um, you know, a really rational, uh, something that you're going to do inside of a casino to beat a casino. This is to try and talk about this very strange idea that often comes up in discussion boards and talks with your friends about an infinite uh, martingale. So what I would recommend is that you just go look up the St. Petersburg paradox and um, read about that because it's a very fascinating question. And you download the spreadsheet that I used here and you study that and you pause the video on that one slide where I showed the mathematics and you read through that. Because once you realize that an infinite martingale has um, an expected loss of infinitely much money on every run, I think you can see that that shouldn't really be a fun thing to do in a casino, even if you have infinitely much money. All right, everyone. Hope that was fun. This is Elliot Jacobson. See you later.